yes friends uh, now let us uh, move on to your amendments in small dealers basically we are talking about your uh, exemption uh, scheme uh, and your composition scheme now first when you talk about your special exemption scheme where you are talking about the limit of 40 lakhs section 23 read along with uh, your notification number 10 bar 2019 CD so there there's an amendment and the same exact amendment is there in your uh, composition scheme where you're talking about your section 10 of CGST Act basically if you see there are certain list of goods uh, where you cannot opt for your uh, 40 lakhs exemption threshold limit uh, from registration and there are again some notified goods where you cannot go for your uh, normal composition scheme which is uh, 150 lakhs 75 lakhs now what have they done along with there was already a list of item which was talking about building materials uh, specifically the item uh, that in hsn number 6815 which was talking about fly ash bricks, uh, bricks or fly ash aggregate with uh, 90 percentage or more fly ash content fly ash blocks now that particular item there are certain notified building materials uh, uh, if at all you're supplying them you cannot go for your uh, 40 lakhs limit now out of the those uh, certain uh, notified building materials hsn6815 the wordings have been replaced now it is fly ash bricks fly ash aggregate and fly ash blocks the point where fly ash aggregate should contain uh, more than 90 percentage of fly ash content is no more there so simple language fly ash bricks fly ash aggregate and fly ash blocks the same thing is uh, there in your uh, uh, normal composition scheme 150 lakhs or 75 lakhs uh, the difference is when you're talking about your exemption scheme if you are supplying them if you are supplying them whether you are a manufacturer or a trader you cannot go for 40 lakhs limit whereas in your uh, composition scheme the focus is not on supply the focus is on the term manufacturer if you are manufacturing them here what is covered is only and only manufacturer if you are manufacturing an item which is uh, covered under your uh, uh, notified items uh, notified building materials uh, hsn being uh, 6815 again that particular item uh, terms have been replaced it is fly ash bricks it was there previously now also it is there fly ash blocks uh, it was there previously now also it is there what has happened is now it is only merely fly ash aggregate the point of more than equal to 90 percentage uh, uh, of fly ash content is no more uh, relevant right so put in a simple terms uh, one of the notified building materials which was there uh, uh, under your uh, special exemption scheme 40 lakhs if at all you are supplying them you cannot go for uh, 40 lakhs and uh, they are under normal composition scheme uh, where you are talking about section 10 where whether he, if you are manufacturing it not supplying if you are manufacturing it you cannot go for a, a normal composition scheme 150 lakhs 75 lakhs that item has been that particular item has been replaced with more clear wordings of uh, hsn 6815 that is heading 6815 now moving on to the amendments in your input tax credit yes there are uh, a lot of amendments when you talk about your input tax credit certain important amendments have also come in and you'll find that a few amendments in your input tax credit and return filing chapter are merely correction uh, because of the amendments elsewhere so we'll be seeing them as well now when you're talking about input tax credit first we are going to see the amendment which has come out in your section 16 section 16 of your cgst act now section 16 is a basic uh, section which talks about uh, conditions for claiming input tax credit now one of uh, the point was uh, in one of the condition they have added there are already a lot of conditions for taking input tax credit to put in total terms after the amendments the total number of conditions for taking input tax credit is uh, 12 previously there were 11 now it is 12 now, what is the other condition new condition that has been added let us see that if you see the basic provision of section 16 subsection 2 it starts with uh, notwithstanding anything uh, contained in this section no registered person shall be entitled to credit of input tax unless unless you are not allowed to have input tax credit unless 
what is given here unless the details of input tax credit in respect of the set supply communicated to such registered supply is not been restricted under section say 38 you will get the details of uh, your input tax credit and your gstr to be to a so that need not be that should not be restricted if you want to in your input tax credit you have to ensure that whatever credit you are getting in your gstr 2a to b first of all you should get that credit in your gstr 2a to b is one of the criteria now whatever you are getting that in your gstr 2a to b under section 38 it should not be restricted it should not be restricted please understand these are two different things supposing i am the recipient i am purchasing from you first is you should have a supply you should have furnished that information in your gstr 1 or information furnishing facility that is iff and only then I'll get in my GSTR to be. So first condition is you should have filed your uh, GSTR one or IFF, and I should have got in my GSTR to be. That is the first criteria. I should satisfy that. Now, in addition to that, I should ensure that that credit has not been restricted. That credit has not been restricted. So that I need to ensure. And in one of the condition of input tax credit, there was reference to your uh, section 43A. Now, wherever in the entire GST uh, law, there are also reference to section 43A. That reference uh, is removed because section 43A itself is omitted. If, if you at all you want to understand the logic, the logic is pretty simple. Section 43A, which was talking about uh, restriction to input tax credit, restrictions on input tax, restriction on availing input tax credit. It was there but it was never notified so there was something called a section 43a which was all about restrictions on availing input tax credit but the fact was it was never ever notified now restrictions for input tax credit is given in section 38 itself therefore there is no need of section 43a again repeated section 43a was talking about restriction on input tax credit but this was never ever notified this section 43a was never ever notified plus now these restrictions are clearly given in section 38 therefore there is no need of section 43a section 43a has been omitted the moment either section 43a has been omitted you need to understand that wherever other that there are other sections which are talking about section 43a the reference to that would be removed the reference to that would be removed so basically you have you have one extra condition being added what is that one extra condition which is being added that extra condition which is being added is for taking the credit now it is not sufficient that you should get the credit in your gsti 2a to b but also you should ensure that that credit credit is not restricted under section 38 you should ensure that you should get it under 2a to b gsti 2a to b but also you should ensure that that credit has not been restricted in terms of your uh, section 38 so these are the two amendments that have been brought in one you're talking about a new condition being added and second is a mere correction what are the reference there was a reference to section 43a in uh, section 16 uh, subsection 2 clause uh, c now that reference to section uh, 43a is not at all relevant because of a very simple fact that section 43a was never ever notified plus you need to understand that it was talking about restriction on input tax credit now these points are there well within your section 38 now before we move on to your uh, other provision which is given below of section 16 subsection 4 we will understand what is section 38 because if you see this uh, uh, first condition it tells that you should ensure that you are getting that credit in gsti 2a to b Plus, whatever credit you are getting in your GSTI 2A to B, you should ensure that it is not restricted under Section 38. So, it becomes extremely, extremely important for you to understand what is Section 38. Basically, the Section 38 is belonging uh, to your written filing chapter. We are taking, we are covering it here. Though it is uh, part of written filing chapter, it has got more uh, relevance to your uh, input tax credit. Now, what does it talks about? It talks about uh, details of inward supplies. How it is all about your inward supplies that is input tax credit details of inward supplies section 38 read along with your uh, rule 16 now the old section 38 entirely has been omitted 
or replaced and that is something called as new section 38 that was old section 38 which was talking about something that has been totally taken off and that's something called as new section 38 now what is this new section 38 talking about the details of outward supplies which is furnished by the registered person so your supply will file uh, your outward supplies uh, under section 37 1 which is your gstr 1 or iff and they are auto generated statement you will get the based on the supplier filing his gstr 1 or iff or such other supply such other supplies here indicates that uh, you are also talking about your uh, gstr uh, 5 gstr 6 so basically when i talk about uh, the registered person who is filing the outward supplies under section 37.1 my focus is on GSTR1 or invoice furnishing facility and such other supplies there may be a non-resident taxable person filing GSTR5 input service distributor filing GSTR6 right so the details of outward supplies furnished by the registered person under section 37.1 which is your GSTR1 or invoice furnishing facility for QRMP scheme and such other supplies which is GSTR5 by non-resident axle person and GSTR6 input service distributor as may be prescribed an auto generated statement containing the details of input tax deduct shall be made available to the recipients so based on the opposite party filing their GSTR1 or IFF or GSTR5 or GSTR6 there will be an auto generated statement which contains the details of input tax credit which is made available to the recipient within such time in such form and manner and within such time right but subject to conditions and restrictions as may be prescribed now what are the conditions and restrictions that are prescribed the auto generated statement which is coming which is discussed uh, in your section uh, 37 1 whatever you are getting in your auto generated statement now there are certain conditions which are very very crucial first you should be if at all i am a recipient i should make sure that my supplier is filing my gstr his gstr1 or iff or gstr5 in case of nrdp gstr6 in case of input service distributor plus in addition to that that auto generated statement which i am getting shall consist of that will consist of what all that auto generated statement will consist of what all details of inward supplies the credit of input tax which may be available so it will give me the recommendation that uh, these are all the details uh, that uh, your supplier has filed and you have got an auto generated statement and this is the portion on which you can take the credit may be available they have used the term may be available and the details of uh, supplies on which credit cannot be availed it will give me two list whatever is appearing in my gst at two a to b which portion credit may be available recommended you may take it which portion credit shall not be you cannot take it mandatory whether wholly or partly on account of the details of supply furnished under section 37 subsection 1 now on what basis that credit is not been available by any registered person within such period of taking registration as may be present which means registered person has taken new registration uh, so uh, his uh, uh, his particular uh, supplies though it is coming in my gsti 2a or 2b i may not be able to take the credit so if it is by a registered person who has filed as uh, gstr1 or uh, iff but he is a newly registered person or by a registered person who has defaulted in payment of tax and such default continued for such period at as, as, as may be reset so basically first point you're talking about a newly registered person for such period of time as the case may be second person you're talking about a person supplier who is not making the payment who's not making the payment for continuous uh, period of such time they will tell that continuously has not made the payment for two months or three months or it, that needs to be prescribed so that particular person has not made the payment and the default is continuing for a particular time as may be prescribed or you're talking about by a registered person the output tax payable as per his gstr1 that is a statement of output supplies gstr1 
exceeds output tax actually paid based on a GST or three V. So first, you are talking about a newly registered person. Supplier is a newly registered person. Second, you are talking about a, a default in payment. He has not. Uh, he has not made the payment for such time as may be prescribed. Third, you are talking about a scenario where the supplier has shown his sales uh, more in GSTR1 but actually paid less based on GSTR3. Because when you talk about GSTR1, there is no payment. Payment is only at the time of GSTR3B. So his uh, outward supplies in GSTR1 is more than outward supplies in GSTR3B on the basis of which he has made the payment. Or you are talking about a scenario by such registered person who has uh, prescribed taken the credit that exceeds the credit that can be availed in, ad in accordance with clause A which means uh, in accordance with clause A means uh, uh, the recommendation that system will give. Now you have not taken the credit more than what is uh, recommended. Your supplier has taken credit more than what is recommended. Your supplier has taken the credit. See your supplier will also get all these auto generated statement. So your also supplier will also get uh, uh, particular uh, credit portion GSA 2A to B which will tell that only this credit you may be availing. But the supplier has taken credit more than what can be availed. More than what can be availed as per your section 38 subsection 2 clause a or by such a registered person who has defaulted in discharging his tax liability in accordance with section 49 subsection 12 so he has not paid the tax liability correctly restrictions in payment right he has made the payment but he has made the payment entirely by his credit ledger so here you're talking about what you're talking about your uh, first ITC is more more away and here you are talking about a scenario where payment is made but payment is not made properly payment is made but payment is not made properly he should have made payment by credit ledger 99 percentage and one percentage by cash but he has made the payment of entire liability by credit ledger so that is a scenario these are all the situations that are coming up now if you look at this particular section 38 it is very 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 dangerous see as a recipient i need to take care that my supplies my credit is there based on my gst at 2a to b the supplier has filed their returns now i am also required to see whether they are doing all the works properly supposing let let us take a scenario where you are talking about an example. Let us take an example to understand what is the risk or how dangerous your section 38 sounds. So you are talking about uh, me being the recipient and I have a lot of suppliers. I have a lot of suppliers. If you see there is supplier 1, supplier 2, supplier 3, 4, 5. Six. I have hundreds of suppliers. Say. I have hundreds of suppliers. Now, out of hundreds of suppliers, I get the details of 90 suppliers in my GSTR auto generated GSTR 2A to B. Supplier 1, supplier 2, supplier 3. I get details only of 90 suppliers in my GSTR 2A to B. So I have purchased some lot of suppliers but what I get in my GSTR 2A to B? What I get in my GSTR 2A to B GST or GSTR 2A which is uh, dynamic keeps on changing but file monthly filing I need not say GSTR 2 I will be saying GSTR 2B which is uh, static. I see 90 suppliers. I see 90 suppliers. Now previously understand that previously what they were trying to tell from 91st supplier to 100th supplier the details of which I am not getting in my GSTR 2A to B I cannot take the credit. So previously the point was pretty pretty simple. If you get in your GSTR 2A to B 
you can take the input tax credit if you don't get in your gscr 2a to b basically gscr 2b on because if i'm finding my returns on monthly basis the gscr 2b 2a is to be checked on a yearly basis where you're filing your annual return i cannot take the input tax credit. that was the mere condition that was a mere condition now additionally i need to take care of others not only i should take me uh, make sure that uh, my suppliers are uh, how i'll get the details in my gsa 2a to b because all my suppliers uh, will be all my suppliers will be filing their returns all my suppliers will be filing their returns they will be filing the gstr1 or iff if at all they are under qrmp scheme invoice furnishing facility they will be filing their iff i'll be getting the details based on that also there are other returns like your gstr5 by nrdp or gstr6 by is which is not so important this is normal scenario special scenario is not so important we are not talking about special scenarios at all our focus is only on the normal scenario so not only i should make sure that the opposite party has filed their gstr1 or iff i should also check what they are doing so i should now check that basically previously cut points are simple out of 100 supplies if 90 supplies have filed their uh, returns gsa1 or iff i'll take the credit and balance i'll not take the credit now i'll postpone the credit i'll not take the credit now i'll get take the credit later when it actually comes i'm not going to take the credit now i may i'll postpone it later right now out of those 90 supplies i need to check all the other details also supposing out of 90 supplies Supposing my first supplier, my first supplier is a newly registered person. Second supplier has defaulted in making the payment for a particular uh, time as maybe as it, as it is prescribed. Third supplier, third supplier, you are talking about a scenario has taken credit more than what is uh, available, what is uh, uh, Recommended because the GSCI 2A to B will tell give you two details. GSCI 2A and 2B will tell that what credit you may avail and what you cannot avail. So it will give you two details. That credit details that ITC may be available. ITC may be available. That is the first details. It will also recommend. Uh, it will also give you the list ITC which cannot be availed cannot be awaited. so my gstr 2a 2b itself will recommend so these are all the list where itc may be available itc may be available look at the wordings may and the second list where i cannot take itc partly or only i cannot that is when i cannot they tell that you should not take it it is kind of mandatory but when I can it will tell it may be available I need to check it further right so that is one supplier who is a newly registered person there is another for supplier who has defaulted in making the payment for prescribed uh, uh, period as it would be preserved at a later point of time my third supplier you are talking about a scenario where he has filed his uh, uh, the sales in his GSTR 1 is more than the sales uh, and the payment in GSTR 3B. My fourth supplier is a person who has taken more ITC than it is recommended. Not me. My supplier has taken more ITC than it is recommended. My supplier 5 is a person who has made the payment. Who has made the payment but uh, improper payment but that payment is improper why the payment is improper i should have paid say 99 percentage by credit ledger and one percentage by cash ledger but i paid entire 100 percentage by credit ledger now look at the irony these five suppliers these five suppliers though i am getting in my gstr to be i cannot take the credit these five supplier I am getting it. These are all available in my GSTR to be, but I cannot take ITC. Say from fifth supplier to ninetieth supplier. Sorry, sixth supplier to 
नाइनटीन सप्लायर आई एम गेटिंग इन माई जी एस टी आर टू बी आई एम गेटिंग इन माई जी एस टी आर टू बी आई टी सी मे बी टेकन आई नीड टू चेक फॉर दर वेदर दर सम एनिलेजिबल पोर्शन ऑन ऑर्डर एंड द लास्ट टेन सप्लायर्स विच आई हैव नॉट गॉट इन माई जी एस टी आर टू बी इट्स Which I have not got in my GSTR to be itself, I cannot take the credit. So that is the beauty of section thirty. Section previously, I should ensure that I have got uh, my purchases uh, in my GSTR to be when I am taking the credit on monthly basis. I have got in my GSTR to be basically you need to check GSTR to be when you are filing your regular returns only in annual return year and basis. I will check GSTR to be. So as of now, GSTR to be. So if I see if I am categorizing my surplus. There are about five suppliers who have filed their returns. Who have filed their returns, and I'm getting in my, I'm actually getting in my GSTR to be, but still I cannot take the ITC. Why? Either that supplier is a person who's registered newly for that particular time, as may be prescribed, or he has defaulted in payment for a particular period, as may be prescribed, or his sales in GSTR one. Outward supplies in GSTR one is more than uh, what is there in GSTR three B on the basis of which he is making the payment. I am getting in my GSTR two B, but I cannot take the credit. Or my supplier has taken the ITC more than what is recommended. So I, when I, my GSTR two A two B will come, maybe in near future, I will have a recommendation. This ITC you may avail it. This ITC you cannot avail it. So I am taking ITC more than what is recommended. Who is taking ITC? My supplier is taking ITC. What is more than recommended? It is all done by my supplier. Or my supplier is making improper payments. I cannot take the credit. Now next is a list where I am talking about my other suppliers not covered in those cases who have filed the GSTR one. I am getting in my GSTR two B. It is also not restricted. These are all the restrictions. These are all the restrictions as per section thirty eight. Now. I have got the credit in my GSTR to be plus there is no restriction as per section 38. My supplies are not covered in that those notified cases. I can take the credit. And those of my suppliers where I am not getting, they have not filed their GSTR one or IFF on time. I am not getting in my GSTR to be. I will not be taking the credit now. I will not be taking the credit now. It is postponed. This credit is being postponed. This particular credit is being. postponed even the same is true with this particular credit also it's not that i cannot take it it is being postponed as of now restricted as of now so that is about uh, your newly drafted section 38 this explanation whatever is given here we have taken understood in form of a detailed example and the reference in section uh, rule 60 Uh, section 38 needs to be read along with rule 60 you need not see that amendment not at all relevant uh, previously the wordings used were auto pop auto drafted now everywhere you will find auto generated auto generated it's not auto drafted anymore it is auto generated statement the gstr 2a to b which i get is not auto drafted anymore it is auto generated gstr to b auto generated so obviously for exams You may easily skip this. Nothing, not at all important. It's not an exam. This is only a corresponding effect of amendment. Not at all relevant for your exams. Now, coming back to the other uh, provisions of your section 16, where the conditions are, have been affected. Now we are talking about the next condition. The one condition that is the new condition is my ITC should not be restricted. I should get the ITC. In my GST had to be that was earlier required. Now the amendment is it should not be restricted, which means I should take care of my receipt suppliers also. Being a recipient, I should see my supplier is not a legally registered person. He has not defaulted in making the payment for a particular time. Uh, his sales in GST are one should not be more than GST are three B one which he is making the payment. I should ensure that uh, his payment is not improper. I should also ensure that my suppliers. Uh, Has not taken ITC than more than what is recommended. So uh, the burden is on the recipient to see what his supplier is, which is actually I am not telling it is difficult. It is impossible for the recipient to take care of all these things. Uh, 
I wish and I pray that this particular section 38 which talks about restrictions for taking ITC for the recipient because supplier is doing something is uh, pretty uh, draconian, highly dangerous for the recipient when he is taking the input tax return. Obviously the provision is there but there are certain things which are yet to be notified. We pray that this provision or restriction under section 38 is not being implemented and is again taken back. Again, coming back to the another condition which is being uh, amended is there is a section called a section 30, 16 subsection 4 which talks about the last date for taking credit. And this uh, effect is you will be finding in your document chapter also written filing chapter. What is the last date for taking the credit? Previously the last date for taking the credit was due date of uh, September return or actual date of uh, annual due date of September uh, return uh, of the succeeding, succeeding financial year or actual date of uh, annual return which was earlier. Now they have removed that uh, due date of September month return of next, fin uh, next financial year and they have replaced it with 30th day of number of next financial year. 30th day of number of next financial year. Let us try to understand this what was the last date last date for taking your input tax credit now before the amendment after the amendment now before the amendment it was due date of september month return of next financial year September return of next financial year or actual date of annual return of that particular financial year of the same financial year whichever is earlier now after the amendment it is not due date and all is 30th of number of next financial year or same the second part remains the same actual date of annual return of that particular financial year whichever is earlier so this area is amended Previously, the focus was on your due date of September of next financial year. Due date of September return of next financial year. Now, it is not based on return. It is 30th November of next financial year. Now, what is the impact? Let us see the impact. Now, normally, due date of September return of next financial year, normally, it was 20th of October of next financial year. normally not always due date would be normally 20th after the next month now if at all i am talking about financial year 2022-23 if i have not taken any credit supposing you are talking about uh, say uh, december 2022 there is an itc of december 2022 which i wish to take which i wish to take on which I wish to take in September return which is to be filed which is to be filed on 19th October or which I wish to take in September return which is filed on 26th October which I wish to take in October return which is filed late which is filed late on 28th of November now these are the scenarios I have missed this ITC this ITC this ITC of December month I have missed now I am willing to take these are three different scenarios these are three different scenarios case one I am willing to take in September return of next financial year supposing september return of next financial year means 
I am talking about September 2023. September 2023 return. So everywhere I am just writing uh, September or October 2019. September 2023 return. September 2023 return. Here it is October 2023 return. Case 1 I am one. I am willing to take in September 2023 return. Case 2 is also I am willing to take in September 2023 return. And case 3 is uh, I am willing to take in October 2023 return. Now before the amendment. What was the scenario? Before amendment and after amendment. Supposing I am talking about one more scenario which I am willing to take in October 2023 written filed on 11th December case 4 so that you understand there is some common point also before the amendment I can take the credit assuming my annual return is filed much much later so I am going with an assumption I am going with an assumption that my annual return is filed on 28th of December 2023 28th of December much later the due date of annual return is 31st of December of next financial year I am filing on the fag end so that is the understanding now before the amendment you need to understand that there is a missed credit of December 2022 which belongs to financial year 22-23 before the amendment if I want to take the credit I have to take the credit in maximum last month September month return filed before the due date so in the first case where it is September written and it is filed before the due date which is 20th of October I was allowed to take the credit I was allowed to take the credit the credit was available but if it is September written September 2023 written September of next financial year written but filed after the due date I was not allowed to take the credit and obviously if it is October return filed after the due date I cannot take the credit if it is October return filed very very late obviously both the cases are filed uh, after the due date filed very very late I cannot take the credit but after the amendment what they have said, they have not tell, they have said any in which return. They have said that any return filed before 30th of November of next year actually. Any return. So you need not be specific. They are not very specific. They are not uh, telling that it should be only September. Any return filed which is filed uh, before 30th of uh, November. So now, after the amendment, if I have missed the credit of December 2022 which belongs to financial year 22-23 and I am willing to take the credit in September of next financial year, September 2023, filed on time. That is on or before the due date, 20th of October 2023. Can I take the credit? Can I take the credit? Yes. I can take the credit. If I am willing to take the credit in September 2023, which is not filed on time, which is filed after the due date, but that filing is uh, before 30th of November of next financial year. Can I take the credit? Yes. If now I am willing to, if I am now, if I have missed the September return, I am not taking the credit in September return. I remember only in October 2023, October of next financial year, which the return of which I am filing late, but, but it is before 30th of November of next financial year. Can I take the credit? Yes. So now, after the amendment, whether it is uh, July return or September. Uh, July return or August return or September return or October return that is not at all relevant. I should have filed. I should have filed those returns on or before 30th of November of next financial year. I should have filed those returns whether it is April of next financial year or May of next financial year or June of next financial year, July of next financial year, August of next financial year, September of next financial year or October of next financial year. I should have filed those returns on or before 30th of November of next financial year, I can take the credit. But, but if it is uh, October return, which I am filing very late, I am filing in December, even now I cannot take the credit. Even now I cannot take the credit. And the Zenta scenario I've assumed that my annual return is filed very, very late. So that to understand that which was, uh, earlier will always be only this. 
I've just gone with an assumption that my annual return is filed uh, very late to just explain the effect of the amendment. So that is the impact of amendment with respect to your time limit. Time limit section 16 subsection 4 in all the provisions you will find that there is an effective date which is not important for the exams but nevertheless you will find that every provision below you will find an effective date from which date this uh, provision is being effective. Now there is another condition uh, which is there which tells that you should have the documents for taking the credit. Now friends we are not talking about section 16 anymore we are talking about your rule 36. Rule 36 is uh, the main condition, the main rule for uh, taking the credit. It talks about documents and other conditions for taking your input uh, tax credit. Now the amendments in Rule 36 are insignificant. They are not of much use. They will never be tested in your exams because they are all uh, corresponding amendments because of amendment in different places. Now if you see the type of amendment that has come out in, in Rule 36.2 they have uh, said that you can get the credit if you have the document there was a wording which tells that and the relevant information as contained of the said document is furnished in GSTR 2 now there is no concept of GSTR 2 so there was when GST was launched they thought that recipient will file something called as GSTR 2 the reference of GSTR 2 was never ever required if you see the note also you'll find that uh, Reference of GSTR 2, you are not talking about 2B or 2A, you talking about GSTR 2 is removed. It was practically never ever there. No one has ever seen something called as GSTR 2. No one has ever filed something called as GSTR 2. You get the auto generated GSTR 2B or 2A. 2B is uh, static, 2A is dynamic, keeps on changing. You get that. But you never file, recipient never file something called as GSTR 2. So that reference is removed. And uh, they have said that. Uh, Another condition which talks about uh, Rule 36.4 documents for taking ITC. They have just corrected uh, the grammar, right? So, if you want to get the input tax credit, the details of that input tax credit on such invoice should be communicated to the registered person in GSTR to be. So, it just tells that the supplier should have filed. Supplier should have filed is GSTR 1 or invoice furnishing facility. And as a recipient, you should get the details of that input tax credit. Previously, the wordings were you should get the details of invoices or debit notes. Now they are telling that you should get the details of input tax credit in relation to such invoices or recipients in your GST to be. That is only a grammatical corrections correction. From your exam point of view, no. Not at all. One place there was a reference of GST to which was never ever there right from the beginning. That is removed other place, they have just added uh, wordings. Previously, the wordings were supply should file as GSTR 1 or IFF and you should get it in GSTR 2B. When you get in GSTR 2B, the wordings were the details of invoices or debit notes. Now, the wordings are details of input tax credit of such in respect of such invoices uh, uh, or your uh, debit notes. So, that is only a grammatical correction in uh, input tax credit in respect of is being added. So, not at all relevant. Now, next you are talking about Rule 37. One of the conditions for taking input tax credit is given in your Rule 37. Where it tells that if you are not making the payment to the supplier within a particular time, which is 180 days, you need to reverse your input tax credit. So, that particular rule, you will find that there is entire replacement. So, there was a Rule 37 sub rule 1 which tells that if you are not making the payment within 180 days you need to reverse ITC you will find the old provision being given old rule 37 1 being given which is now replaced by new 37 1 now what is the impact let us see the impact now what they are telling a registered person who has availed input tax credit of any invert supplies uh, of goods or sources or both other than supplies on which tax is payable in the reverse charge mechanism but he fails to make the payment to the supplier the amount of value of such supply along with the tax within the time specified that is within 180 days 
in section 6th section subsection 2 he shall pay an amount now what is the impact he shall pay an amount which is nothing but the amount that of input tax credit that he has taken with interest computed under section 50 while furnishing his gst or 3b of tax period immediately following the period of 180 days so whenever that 180 days period is crossing and still you are not making the payment immediately post that if you are filing any GSTR 3B you need to include that and this provision is also not applicable where you are talking about schedule 1 cases because there is no uh, consideration at all that is also not applicable where you are talking about uh, a value of supplies being added there is an addition amount because uh, uh, your recipient has paid to third party on behalf of the supplier so see there are three exceptions it is not applicable for your uh, rcm it is not applicable for schedule one deemed supply cases it is not applicable for uh, recipient making the payment to third party on behalf of supplier they remain the same there's no no change per se now you may feel that then what is the change the welcome change that is uh, there is now interest computation is not given here interest computation is taken to your uh, newly amended section 50 that is first thing second thing now they tell that you need to reverse the entire itc not proportionate itc whatever itc you have taken you have to reverse it even if you have not paid small amount even if you have not paid small amount you have to the reverse the entire input tax credit with interest so that is that is the impact so you will see two impacts even if partial payment is not made within 180 days entire itc not only proportionate it's full itc the value of services 10 lakhs and gsc is 1 lakh 80 thousand i have already out of 10 lakhs plus 1 lakh 80 thousand which is 11 lakh 80 thousand i have already paid 10 lakhs only 1 lakh 80 thousand is spending but still i need to reverse full itc and not just proportionate itc and secondly interest now is linked to your section 50 so we'll see what is section 50 how interest is calculated we'll see it that that is first point section uh, rule 37 sub rule 1 now rule uh, 37 sub rule 2 is also being replaced what it is trying to tell it is saying that only and only when that registered person subsequently makes the payment of the value and the tax full value and the tax he shall be entitled to re-avail the entire income tax credit so what are they trying to tell even if small payment is not made within 180 days first to fully reverse entire itc with interest and only when you make the entire payment only and only when you make the full payment whatever itc was reversed earlier will be re-availing and forget about interest interest uh, paid in between was a cost interest paid in between was a cost now they are very 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 clear so when you get the invoice when you get the invoice take the credit take the credit when you get the invoice right there are multiple scenarios you pay within 180 days you pay within pay fully in 180 days pay partially in 180 days pay partially after 180 days and or pay fully after 180 days now out of these three different scenarios scenario 1 scenario 2 scenario 3 now the amended rule that is on tells that in the first case the moment you get your invoice first you have taken first you have taken input tax credit and if you have paid within your 180 days nothing will happen if you have paid even partially after 180 days even that is partial payment after 180 days you have to reverse itc with interest interest computation is now linked to section 50 so you need to see that and in the second and third cases you can re-avail you can re-avail 
ITC. You can re-avail ITC only on on full payment of value plus tax. So what are they trying to tell? Even if there is a partial amount which is paid after 180 days, even if there is partial amount which is to be paid after 180 days, make sure that the moment you cross 180 days, a small portion of the payment is pending, finished, reverse ITC with interest. Interest completion as per section 50, linked to section 50. And you can re-avail the credit, no time limit. After two years, after five years, re-avail it. Only on full payment of value and tax. So things are again very dangerous. They're telling that you are almost paid 90% of the value plus tax, only some 10% spending. Forget about that, you reverse full ITC with interest. Interest calculation as per section 50. So when you pay the balance amount, whenever the full payment is made, then whatever credit was reverse full credit was yours, you'll get uh, reavail the full ITC, but interest paid in this entire process, interest paid would be a cost. So things are very, very, very dangerous in your uh, newly amended rule 37. Right, this uh, section 38, read along with rule 60, which was a part of written filing chapter we have discussed. Also, you are talking about uh, the next provision, this is again a part of written filing chapter, section 41. Section 41 is fully replaced, old section 41 is gone, you are talking about provisional ITC, new section 41. New section 41 claim of provisional ITC, provisional ITC and final ITC. So that is one of the conditions. Basically section 38 and section 41 are the sections of written filing chapter but we are discussing in your uh, input tax credit because section 41 talks about claim of ITC and provisional acceptance thereof. You will find uh, interesting things. Every registered person shall subject to the conditions and restrictions uh, whatever is there in your ITC chapter avail input tax credit. So he shall be eligible for input tax credit after crossing all the conditions and restrictions. Right, he'll take the self-assist input tax credit in his electronic credit ledger. So first he'll take it. Self-assist. He'll himself assess it. The credit availed by a registered person under section 41 subsection 1 in respect of such goods or supplies, uh, the tax payable whereon has not been paid by the supplier. If the supplier has not made the payment of tax, the supplier has not pay, made the payment of tax. See, in addition to supplier filing his GSTR1 or IFF and I getting in my GSTR2B, I, I should ensure that supplier has also paid the tax. If supplier has not paid the tax, I will reverse it along with interest. I will reverse it along with interest. And later point of time, if supplier makes the payment of tax, I shall re-avail the credit reversed as we request right. Right, so what again they are trying to tell, this is another condition that supplier should have paid the tax, one of the condition of input tax credit, that supplier should have paid the tax. Supplier should have filed a GSTR1 and IFF and I should have got in my GSTR2B is one of the condition. This another condition is supplier should have filed a GSTR3B and made the payment of tax. So initially they tell that you take input tax credit. Supplier making the payment of tax will be done later. We first take input tax credit. See the all the other conditions and restrictions, take input tax credit, avail input tax credit. Later point of time, if any supplier has not made the payment of tax, you need to reverse input tax credit with interest. Again, here interest comes. Now, please understand that uh, how you will come to know that supplier has not pay, made the payment of tax. This would be ascertained by officer at the time of scrutiny or any other proceedings. This you will not know that supplier has paid the tax or not. This will be ascertained by the proper officer at the time of scrutiny, audit, inspection, etc. etc. And later point of time with that supplier, you find that supplier has already later point of time paid the tax. You can re-avail the, re-avail the input tax credit. So first they tell that don't worry about supply. This need, this condition cannot be satisfied real time. So first they tell that you please take the input tax credit. 
and if proper officer at a later point of time tells that your supplier has not made the payment of tax you please reverse that with interest and you later on find with the supplier that he has actually made the payment of tax later you can re-avail the input tax credit interest will be cost you can re-avail the input tax credit right an important thing to notice there is basically no time limit as to when this provisional ITC the ITC initially which you take is provisional ITC final ITC is only when supplier has paid the tax so there is no time limit uh, you, your supplier may have paid the tax after 4 years your provisional ITC that you have taken in the beginning will become final ITC right so initially please understand that a lot of doubts have come out on this condition a lot of times even in the old section 41 should I check that my supplier has paid the tax real time no I'll assume that my supplier has paid the tax, I'll take the credit. When at a later point of time, my proper officer tells that your supplier has not made the payment of tax, I need to reverse ITC with interest. But thereafter, if supplier pays the tax again, I can reclaim the input tax credit. Right. Now, there's an amendment in your uh, rule 43 which deals with uh, Proportionate ITC on your capital goods. Proportionate ITC on your capital goods. Whether actually this amendment is there in Rule 43, but it is uh, true for your proportional ITC on inputs and input sources as well as uh, <coughs> your capital goods. Rule 43. Now, what is that amendment? That is an explanation to to Rule 43. Now, what does that explanation to tells? It tells not only for the purpose of uh, this rule, but also for Rule 42 proportionate ITC on your input and input services as well as this rule 43 is proportional ITC on capital goods it is hereby clarified that aggregate value of exempt supplies shall exclude it will exclude aggregate value of exempt supplies will ex exclude not include will exclude what value of supply of duty credit strips value of supply of duty credit strips there is already a list Along with that list, one more point D is added value of supply of duty credit strips. Now, what are they trying to tell? Normally, when you talk about your uh, rule 42, and your rule 43, proportionate uh, ITC on your uh, inputs and input sources, rule 42 proportionate ITC on your capital goods the reversal is based on what the reversal of ITC first you will avail full ITC first you will get full ITC then you will reverse ITC you will reverse a part of ITC the formula is ITC multiplied by value of exempt supplies divided by adjusted total turnover of that state or union territory so you basically the focus is on value of exempt supplies reversal will be based on the more you have exempted supplies the more will be the reversal now what they have said explanation 2 to rule 43 tells defines this uh, explanation 2 to rule 43 defines this value of exempt supplies now understand that technically your your duty credit strips Technically, your duty credit scripts, duty credit scripts. Say, for example, your uh, now you don't have MES script, RODT EPs, remission of duties and taxes on exported product, or SCIS script, service export from India scheme. There are a lot of duty credit scripts. It is not having any tax. It is exempted. There's no GST. There is no GST. When there is no GST, it will be basically added in. When there is no GST, it will be basically added in value of exempt supply, and there will be some reversal. Now they tell that no, no, this uh, duty credit credit script, you though it is actually exempt, you don't include in value of exempt supplies for the reversal. Strictly speaking, technically speaking, it is actually exempt. It is actually actually exempt but it, this portion is not included not included in your 
value of exam supplies when it is not included in your value of exam supplies obviously what would happen is no reversal because of duty credit scripts there is no reversal because of duty credit scripts though i have duty credit scripts which i am selling it at a discounted price which is exempt technically it is exempt when it or whenever something is exempt i need to reverse something but i am not going to reverse anything because my value of exam supplies as per explanation 2 to rule 43 will not include duty credit scripts though technically it is exempt technically it is exempt but it will not be included in my value of exam supplies when i don't include it in value of exam supplies because of this there won't be any reversal i repeat technically duty credit scripts when i sell it is exempt so my normal product so my i have 100 crores turnover i have 100 crores turnover on which i am paying gst i have duty credit scripts say only 50 lakhs on which i am not paying gst so this is a normal uh, normal goods or services and this is duty credit script duty credit script now technically it is exempt so i will not because of this i will not have rule 42 or rule 43 reversal though i have some exempt when i tell i am not going to pay gst though i have some exempt supply my duty credit script is technically exempt supply but 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 there won't be any rule 42 43 reversal because of this exempt supply because this is not included in value of exempt supply so that is the amendment which is there and uh, other uh, points you need not even focus on us there are other uh, places where you find amendments forget about this entire places because you will find that there is an amendment in your uh, rule 38 we are talking about uh, proportionate credit by banks and financial institutions rule 42 pro rata credit on inputs and input services rule 43 pro rata credit on capital goods proportionate credit in all these spaces there is a reference to section uh, there is a reference to gstr2 just a few moment back i said that gstr2 was never ever practically effective right from the beginning of gst no one has ever seen how a gstr2 works because it never came out so wherever there was a reference to gstr2 wherever you had this reference to gstr2 uh, that reference to gstr2 is now omitted in all these places so from exam point of view no it is not at all important it is only an uh, impact of uh, amendment because of other amendments there is a corollary amendment which has come out here now we are talking about your uh, next uh, chapter documents where you have certain amendments now in document chapter basically the important amendment that has come out is uh, the limit of invoicing being reduced from 20 crores to 10 crores so when you are talking about e invoicing e invoicing then we'll see the other one is rule 48 sub rule 4 e invoicing basically previously was applicable if your aggregate turnover in any of the preceding financial year right starting from 17 18 till now exceeds previously the limit was 20 crores now the limit is 10 crores they have reduced the limit they have reduced the limit from 20 crores they have brought it down to 10 crores so if at all in any of the preceding financial year any right from starting from 1718 if it in if in 1718 or 1819 or 1920 or uh, 2021 or in 2122 any of the preceding financial year right starting from 1718 if my turnover is more than 10 crores then in the current financial year that is say 2223 e invoicing will be applicable so if you are standing in financial year 2000 22 to 23 i have to see all the other financial year right starting from financial year 17 18 or financial year 18 19 or you are talking about financial year 19 20 or financial year 20 21 or financial year 21 22 if in any of these preceding financial year any everywhere the wording is or 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 if in any of these 
preceding financial years if i tell that pan india aggregate turnover is more than 10 crores is more than 10 crores previously it was 20 crores now it is more than 10 crores aggregate turnover is more than 10 crores is in 1718 or in 1819 or in 1920 or in 2021 or in 2122 then then e invoicing is applicable if this is this then e invoicing will be applicable in that current financial year which is say in our example 22 23 so that is the amendment that have been brought in now the other amendment again which is related to e invoice which is uh, given in rule 46 rule 46 so which is again related to e invoicing see this point that is all again related to your e invoicing so what a tax invoice should contain subject to rule 54 rule 54 is in special cases a tax invoice uh, as in section 31 issued by registered person shall contain following particulars so there is a long list of details what a tax invoice should contain contents of uh, tax invoices given in your rule 46 now they have added one content specific content telling that a person who has to give a declaration that uh, invoice is not required to be given in accordance with rule 48 sub rule 4 which means e invoicing he is not giving e invoicing though his aggregate turnover in preceding financial year right from 1718 is more than the aggregate turnover which is required for e invoicing he is trying to tell that see my aggregate turnover is more than what is required for e invoicing as of now my aggregate turnover is more than uh, 10 crores in my preceding financial year right starting from 1718 or 1819 or 1920 or 2021 or 2122 so it is more than so in our in the present scenario context it is more than say 10 crores even then i am not giving e invoicing so i have to give a declaration what declaration i or we hereby declare that our aggregate turnover in preceding financial year from 1718 onwards is more than the aggregate turnover for e invoicing it is more we accept that our aggregate turnover is more than uh, what is required for e invoicing but still we are not required to prepare e invoice now you may be confused when a particular person will give this declaration so if you see the note if you see the note you will find out there are certain categories of persons though your aggregate turnover is more than more than what is required for e invoicing you are not required you are exempted from e invoicing in certain cases exempted from e invoicing for example banks scz units there are long list there's a list where you are not required to give multiplex screens banks scz units so there's a list where you are exempted from invoicing even if your turnover is more than the limit so if your aggregate turnover is more than the limit which is there in rule 48 sub rule 4 which means as of now it was 10 crores in preceding financial year right starting from 1780 even then you are exempted so if basically if you are covered by e invoicing but exempted then you have to write this declaration that my aggregate turnover is more than what is required for e invoicing right for starting from 1718 till date but still i am not required to give e invoicing because of the exemption available so i have to add a declaration so this declaration will be there on my this declaration will be there on my tax invoice so that recipient will understand the person who is getting the goods or services will understand that okay his turnover is more than what is required for e invoicing but he is not giving me e invoice because he is covered by exempted category maybe he is uh, you are talking about banks or maybe you are talking about multiplex screens or maybe you are talking about your uh, scz units they are exempted from e invoicing so they have to give this particular declaration additional content of your tax invoice so that is another amendment here now one more amendment which has uh, come in your document chapters related to your credit note debit note section 34 now there is no time limit for giving debit note supplementary invoice you have to pay extra output tax as no time limit but there is a time limit for giving credit note last date for giving credit note 
so previously what was the last date for uh, giving credit note it was you can give credit note not later than september month following the end of the financial year september of next financial year or actual date of furnishing of uh, relevant annual return whichever is earlier now that september month has been replaced by number it is this amendment is in uh, line with the amendment in the time limit for input tax credit everywhere september is now replaced by 30th of november right earlier last date for uh, giving credit note earlier the last date for issuing credit notes say for financial year uh, 2022-23 for a particular financial year earlier before amendment now this uh, after amendment before amendment it was 30th of september of 2023 30th september of next financial year or actual date of annual return of financial year that financial year 2022-23 now it is 30th you can give credit note on or before 30th of number 2023 or actual date of annual return of that financial year 2000 22 23 so earlier the last date for raising credit note was 30th september of next financial year or actual date of annual return of that financial year now it is replaced by 30th november so there's a small difference when you compare with the input tax credit i can give credit note i can give credit note on issue credit note on 30th november 2023 which can be filed that number written can be filed say on 10th December 2023 or say even 15th December 2023 see with respect to input tax credit I should get the credit on or before 30th number on the portal with respect to input tax credit I should get that input tax credit on or before 30th number 30th number on the portal electronic credit ledger should contain the credit on or before 30th number so it is possible it is possible while uh, uh, filing my April month return of next financial year, May month return of next financial year, June, July, August, September, October. And that these returns should be filed on or before 30th of number of next financial year. But as far as credit note is concerned, I have to raise credit note. Not on return, I have to raise credit note. That raising of credit note should happen on or before 30th of number raising of credit note should have happened on or before 30th of number and that can be included in my number months gstr1 number 2023 gstr1 which can be filed later so it can be included in number gs uh, number 23 gstr1 which can be filed uh, on 10th of december or before the due date of number written or 15th december so that for credit the last date to take the credit on portal was 30th number which means i cannot uh, uh, take the credit in number month return it should be la maximum october month return filed on now before 30th number but in credit note they have, to, uh, they have said that i should issue credit note before 30th of number if i issue credit note before 30th of number i can report it on my return in my number month return also not necessarily October month return in my November month return also I can include it which I can file on time or after time so that's a different small difference that you need to understand so that is all about your uh, amendments in document chapter